was mediation. And that will be um, on uh, May 13th from the, at nine o'clock. And then we'll be finishing up our program on June 10th with Adam Foreman. He's a um, employment lawyer who uh, has a real special area that I don't think anybody in the country uh, can trump him on. And that's on revisiting social media responses. So he provides to many of the lawyers in the area and he's provided to our LIRA members um, uh, a, a massive st study he's done on social media and the law, especially as it relates to labor and employment. And this one is going to be talking about the pandemic and the political divide in the United States. Um, so let me get to our speaker. Uh, before I get into some of the more formal stuff, I was interim um, head of HR for University of Toledo a few years back. And so many people came up to me and said, well, you got to meet this guy in the business school. He is just a dynamo. And of course, his schedule was a killer schedule, but I eventually got to meet him. And boy, were they right. And I have been blessed. I've been the beneficiary of knowing him ever since. And I think you're going to feel that same way as well, because this guy um, has been teaching at the University of Toledo College of Business and Innovation uh, for most of his academic career. He has all of the awards you can imagine. Best teacher, um, the Economist, the magazine The Economist has ranked him as one of the top business professors in the world. Um, he is known across the country as a transformational leader in America. He uh, does not only the teaching that he gets awards for with his students, but he also counsels um, our leading companies in the United States. He is an expert on uh, firm performance, people performance, organizational design and organizational strategy. I could go on and on. He sold hundreds of thousands of books. But what brings us today, oh, and before any of you got on, he gave us a little preview of his current study on uh, CEOs in the pandemic. And I hope one day we might be able to talk to him about that. But what brought us to today's is my last conversation with him. He told me about a fascinating study on uh, the tenure of HR executives in companies and what we should know about that if we want to be effective. And you know, even put a different way, we'll, if we don't want to get fired. Um, but with that, I'm going to turn it over to Professor Clint Logenecker. Clint, it's all yours. Thank you, Bob. I really appreciate it. Can everybody hear uh, my voice okay? Is this good? Uh, I'm, from, I'm, I'm talking to you today from Winston-Salem, North Carolina. My lovely wife of 33 years, Cindy, and I are down here visiting our daughter and her husband. And uh, you know what? North Carolina is a beautiful state, but there's no place like home. Uh, so it's really a lot of fun to be out there. I just see my dear friend, Chris Anderson. I got to give Chris Anderson a shout out. Uh, Chris is a well-known figure in, in our community and our region. And uh, I really appreciate, he might be the biggest thinking person that I know. So he's a very gifted young guy and he comes from a terrific family. So Chris, I had to say good morning to you. And certainly my friend, you have better things to do this morning than to be here with us. So all that to say, hey, it's a privilege to be here. I'll move very quickly this morning. You know, um, there's all different kinds of Zoom meetings. Like I've heard some early on in the pandemic, there were a lot of doom Zoom meetings where the news was all bad and it was really negative, uh, coupled with gloom Zoom meetings where things continue to be worse. But today I'm gonna have a Zoom Zoom meeting. And that means it's gonna move quickly, but it's gonna be a Zoom Zoom bloom meeting because I want some ideas to take fruition or to maybe remind you of some really important things. So let's jump right in. I'm gonna go back and forth with the screen. We will try to engage everyone in the conversation. We're gonna have at least one, if not two breakouts. And I promise to move very, very quickly. So uh, as Bob mentioned, I've been at the University of Toledo for 37 years. I absolutely love my job. I really appreciate the opportunity to serve others. And when Bob asked me to do this, I had to jump on it because I'm all about helping people become better at what they do. So with that backdrop, let me grab the screen very quickly and we will jump into our conversation today. Before we launch, uh, please make use of the chat function and Bob will keep an eye on that chat function. So if you have something, a question that you might wanna ask, type it in, there's a good chance I won't catch it. 
So if you get bombed, uh, you send it to Bob or you can send it to all, we'll, we'll pick up on it. Feel free to interrupt or stop at any time so that we can continue to uh, you know, address questions. So here's the, here's the question uh, and here's the statement. This is a study that we did uh, about 20 months ago, pre-pandemic, why senior HR leaders get fired. And it's, it's uh, taken a lot of traction. I've got a lot of phone calls and there's been a lot of attention about it. And I think part of it's the title. So as we go through this, I, as, as Bob mentioned, I am at the University of Toledo, one of America's 27 comprehensive universities, along with the University of Michigan. That means we have at least seven professional schools. We actually have nine at the University of Toledo and it's been an awesome place. I went to Toledo as in 1973 as an 18-year-old kid who was going to major in football and minor in school. And the system kind of grabbed me and said, Clint, uh, you need to major in school and minor in football. So I had some great people that helped me get that done. Uh, very quickly, a co-study authors. So the paper that we're going to be referencing in this discussion, um, the co-authors are Dr. Sherry Caldwell, and she's the Vice President of Human Resources at North Star Blue Scope Steel in Delta, Ohio. And Dr. Deborah Ball, uh, who is the Vice President of Human Resources for Mercy Health System. And these are just dear friends. These are outstanding folks that have had a big impact on my life and career. And I'm really appreciative to be able to call them friends. So with that, I want to add a couple facts about our study that we conducted. So we had 211 senior HR leaders. This was part of an educational development program. We had focus group discussions around the question, hey, based on your experience, why do senior HR leaders get fired? The average experience among members of the group was 25.6 years. The sample size was 58% uh, male, 42% female. And the article was published in the Strategic HR Review, uh, Volume 5 of 2020. Now, one of the nice parts about doing qualitative work, which I do a lot of, is that I don't come in with the assumptions. I don't maybe even assume I know enough to put together a questionnaire to put the issues out there. But what I like to do is sit down with people, talk with people, interview them, and then open up channels of communication so people can talk about what they're doing and what they're learning and all those things along the way. So uh, one of the rich parts about this is you're always capturing quotes. So here's a great quote. In my experience, I've learned a lot of senior HR leaders that I've learned that they come and they go sometimes on their own terms, but other times they were let go for a wide variety of reasons, many of which could be controlled or could have been controlled. In the end, senior HR leaders need to make a difference in the business's performance and think and act both strategically and tactically. Now, this is important. They need to be a team player. They need to support others. They need to be innovative. They need to know how to lead and build a team. And hey, the job isn't getting any easier. So I would dare say that most people on, in this meeting this morning can agree with much of what was said by this veteran HR professional. It comes down to delivering desired outcomes or results for our organizations. And that's a, that's a big plate to fill these days. So if we continue in the discussion, let me, if I may, our goal in the next, and I'm looking at my clock right now, in the remaining uh, 48 minutes is to get you to think. And so I think the biggest thing that I can do is not just put information in front of you, but to get you to think about some really important questions that we're going to review today. So our superordinate learning objective today is to be the best HR leader, the best professional that you can possibly be. And we all know the, the picture, the sculpture of the thinker. So here's the backstory about the thinker though. So the thinker is actually part of a larger piece of, of sculpting that was done by a French artist. And this is really interesting. The thinker was originally called the poet by French sculptor, Augustin Rodin. And it was the crowning element of his work, the gates of hell. So now when you look at this, and there's a life lesson here for all of us, when we go through difficult times, it typically makes us more reflective. So what Rodin is doing here, and if you, you can't really see the details on this, but this is probably worth a Google search when we're done. He is looking down into the abyss of hell. And, he's, and the, the thought process behind this is he was trying to figure out what, what caused people to make these decisions that put them this very, in this very dark, 
tormented and difficult place. And actually the sculpture, I wanna encourage you to go look at it. The sculpture is quite remarkable, uh, the attention to detail. So that's where the thinker came from. So our goal is to get you to think. So my career question is this, how can leaders get better results more quickly for their organizations? And so I came out of Penn State University in 1984 with this question. And I have spent the last 37 years exploring, drilling down, meeting with people, talking, and then translating what we've learned into best practices for all kinds of organizations out there. I'm very fortunate to work with a wide variety of manufacturing and service enterprises, uh, and they all have the same set of issues these days. I also have the privilege of serving uh, the military and members of the intelligence community through my research and my work. Actually, this week I was at the Army National Guard uh, National Training Center in Little Rock, Arkansas, doing a, a program for their senior leaders there. And, and there's a reoccurring theme across all these organizations. The fact is they all share the same reality that they need their leaders to do more of the things that cause higher levels of performance and deliver great results more quickly. And so that is my summary statement here. Leaders need to learn faster. So at many levels, this is all about speed learning for all of us. So we're gonna do three minutes and Bob, I'm gonna ask you to keep the clock on this if you would. I'd like to do three quick minutes on how adults learn and how that should impact when we go to a Zoom meeting like this or some form of instruction or we read a book or listen to an awesome podcast, what we might do with that good information. So the assumption has always been that if you put the right information in front of people, that people are going to learn. But we know if there is not some level, and especially for adult learners, if there is not some level of motivation and inner drive to do something with that information, an excitement around the information, a desire to move forward with that information, it's just information. And we know that we are all drowning these days in information. So now the key is when we identify, let's say I throw out a topic today that's really important for you, maybe the importance of, of improving your emotional intelligence or maybe looking for best practices in HR. The process of integration is when we grab hold of information now, we tear it apart, we reassemble it, and we make it part of who we are. So I'm gonna encourage you to think about a skill, one or two skills that you really need to take up a notch. What does that look like? Because integration is the process of learning more. So if I want to become more effective at best practices of HR, maybe I need to read a book. Maybe I need to interview five people who are really good. Maybe I need to go look at some research articles or watch some YouTube videos or sit in on some podcasts or come to a meeting like this. Now, once we know what we're doing and we can explain it, tear it apart, reassemble it, now we're in a position, then we can go to the point where we have application. And application is when we start to do the best part about it, application is more often than not observable. So if we're applying some skill and we're testing it out, we're trying to get better at it, now we're in a position to be coached. All right, question, who is helping you and holding you accountable to be the best version of yourself? That's my question. And if you don't have an accountability partner, a personal board of directors, some people that you surround yourself with to encourage you and to hold you accountable, to get better at your game and to coach you and to do things different, to help you do things differently, then you will never get at transformation. And transformation should be the goal of all learning activities. We want to come in one way and come out a better and improved version of ourselves. So that, my friends, is three minutes. And Bob, where are we at time-wise? I'm going to guess two minutes and 45 seconds. Did I lose you? Okay, we'll continue to move forward then. Okay. So on this page right now, and if you have your phones with you, snap a quick picture of this page because we're only going to be here for about a minute and then we're going to go into breakouts. So I'm going to ask you to look at these four questions for yourself. Name two things that you've learned about yourself during the COVID-19 viral trial. Secondly, what is your definition of the word leadership? Thirdly, Name two skills HR leaders need to possess to be successful with their careers. And then finally, name one reason why you believe senior HR leaders get fired. 
So what I'm going to ask you to do right now is to take a look at those. I'll give you 30 seconds to prep your answers, and then we're going to break out and share some of that information with each other. Hey, Bernadette, are you out there? Yes, I am. I do not have the breakout function uh, on mine. So could oh, you, you don't. break okay. us out into four? Or I'm sorry, make it five groups, please. Absolutely. Thank and you. Just assign randomly. Uh, that would be great. And you can leave me out. Okay. Then just don't join. There you go. All right. You ready for me to start those? Um, hey, everybody, if you're ready to go, uh, if you haven't snapped a picture of it, I think you can help each other. But when you get in your breakouts, what I'm going to ask you to do is introduce yourselves and then take take a couple, maybe you've got an opportunity for a minute each to walk us through these uh, your response to these kind of important questions, if you would. So Bernadette, thank you for breaking this out. Okay. Here we go. Hi, hi there. <clears throat> hi, Emily. Hi, Sylvester. I'm Gail Sanderson. Hey, um, hi, everybody. I'm in the Detroit market, and uh, I run a, a, a job search group for HR executives who are in career transition. Um, and uh, um, Sylvester, what do you do? I work for a uh, state of Michigan wage and hour division. Okay. I'm a man, uh, regional manager. Okay, great. And Emily, what do you do? I, I actually work for Lyra. So oh. I, yeah, and, uh, and we, we only have a tiny staff. We have a staff of two. So I'm one of two people. That where are you? Me. We're located in central Illinois oh, excellent. at the University of Illinois. It's our headquarters. Okay. Um, I, I will start to, I'll do this real quick is okay. what I learn about myself is I have to be busy all the time and it's hard to be busy um, when you're at home because you find thing, other things to do than what you should be doing. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, um, the definition of leadership to me is um, uh, the captain of the ship who's keeping the ship out of, out of trouble and going in the right direction. And uh, to, um, uh, two, what is the definitions of, uh, or two, two skills. Oh, two skills for, for leadership mm -hmm. is, uh, to me is communication and empathy. And then why leaders get fired. I got to say is because they get a new CEO. Oh, that's a good answer. I was kind of stumped on that one. I, um, did you have answers for all of those Sylvester? Yeah, well, pretty much I agree with her on one thing, but the, uh, the, the name of two things that I learned about myself during COVID is one, I have to have a routine and be organized. Mm -hmm. It's very, <clears throat> very difficult to function in an environment where you work at home and you're not used to going in the office anymore. Um, you can develop some bad habits. <laughs> yep. <laughs> Work-wise and personal bad habits as well, you know, not getting enough exercise, not moving around, you know. So, uh, and what's my definition of of the word for leadership would be uh, accountability and and responsibility would be my my word for leadership, being accountable. Um, and two skills uh, that the HR leader needs to possess, I think 
I agree with uh, Gail with the communication and, and, and basically have an empathy or uh, it, those are important skills. Um, mm -hmm. The reason why senior HR leaders get fired, I tend to agree, probably a change in environment, you know, whether it's the CEO or direction of the workplace of, and I thought I think that's those are the, that would be the top reasons why a CEO would leave, you know get fired. Yeah. Well, <clears throat> I'm not in HR, but um, one thing I've learned about COVID since um, this has all begun is I am definitely an introvert, <laughs> 100. And I mean, I don't want to make light of a pandemic, but it's been a very good year for me. So. I mean, I function really well independently, and I I can't complain about anything. I, mean, I am really happy, though, to have my freedom back. You know, now that I've gotten the vaccination, it just feels amazing. Like, oh, I can go visit my, my the newest members of my family that have been born and, and stuff like that. So I'm really thrilled about that. As far as leadership goes, I really think it's people who influence others and have that ability. Um, the two skills, I definitely would agree with the, uh, the communication. I'm not the best communicator, <laughs> especially verbally. I can really do well in an email. Um, and then, but I, as far as the empathy one, I actually hadn't really thought of that before. So I'm very interested in that. Um, uh, so that's probably something I need to be better at. And then uh, as far as the senior, why they get fired, um, this is a total guess, but I would, I, I feel like the HR directors are in a weird position in the company because you're supposed to be championing the people that work for the company, but you really are just following the directives of the management. So you're kind of in a, a difficult position. <laughs> and it seems to an outsider's viewpoint because I've never been an HR director. But um, that seems to me like it would be a difficult place to be in. I, I totally agree with you on that one. Um, being in HR, you know, everybody thinks that you're supposed to be on their side and that's not necessarily true. So you kind of, you get it on, on from all sides all the time. So it's really difficult. And in the Detroit market, um, we've had so much, uh, business is closing and um, downsizing. So there's been a lot of people moved out of senior level positions. And of course, they're generally older. So mm. it makes it that much harder for them to land in a good position. Yeah, so, that would be terrible. Yeah. So I think we're going to be done in about 22 seconds. But I'm really impressed on how Clint knows how to use all this technology. I mean, good for him, you know? Oh, he is impressive. I was just looking at the uh, array of people he's advised. I was like, wow. Yeah. Oh, that's Pretty great. Cool. Well, nice talking yeah, to you, Sylvester and Emily. Person. Yeah. Uh, what did you say? I just said, Gail, you Different entities. Yep. All right, here everyone is. Welcome back, everybody. Are we all back? So if, you would, if, if you're in a position to do so, please turn your camera on and unmute yourself. So this, I, we allowed ourselves 30 minutes to set the table before we get into the meet. So we're, we're right on schedule. Um, hey, could I ask, uh, let's think about this. Alberta, would you share a couple things you heard people mention about lessons from the, the viral trial, if you would? Oh, okay. Um, What'd you hear? Well, uh, we t discussed mainly the, the number one question is what have we learned since uh, COVID-19? And uh, one comment was uh, they've had the ability to discover um, their, I'll call them roommates because that's, that's what I named my family or roommates. Um, and people have discovered being a family again, uh, the closeness and, but then they still enjoy, and I'm speaking of all the mediators wound up in the same room. Uh, we, we enjoy being out uh, doing face-to-face -face meetings with the customers, but we also have discovered our home life again. 
And yeah. uh, it's a joy when we can get out and go out and visit with others now. Uh, we've learned over the past 12 months. And also uh, Larry commented, uh, Larry Sadrowski commented that uh, the COVID-19 uh, year has been a disruptive uh, experience to what we normally do uh, every day. Okay, very well said. And so if we asked everybody to chime in on this, people would talk about pivoting. People would talk about we're more flexible. We've acquired new talents. We can solve problems pretty quickly. Appreciation for family, a thankfulness for all the things we took for granted beforehand and the importance and power of human touch along the way. All right, so could I ask, uh, let's see here, who would volunteer to address question number two? Gail, would you mind to do that for us, please? Um, sure. Um, we what talked about the mean? definition of leadership, and um, I brought up that that they're, you're the captain of the ship, and your big job is to get where you're supposed to go without having the ship sink. <laughs> so okay, you've got yeah. two big, big jobs, and uh, um, I think you know everybody else kind of agreed that that uh, that person had a responsibility to the management team um, and to others to be sure that everybody's going in the right direction. Okay, very well said. And I love the word picture, captain of the ship, the person in charge to make sure that the ship gets to where it's going and that we deliver desired outcomes along the way. Yep. Very, very well said. Uh, Wanda Mays, would you do question number three for us? What did you hear your group members share? You need to unmute, my friend. Sorry, I thought I had done that already. That's we okay, talked man. about the uh, need to navigate politics sometimes because um, uh, I, I worked for 12 years for the city of Detroit and we would change mayors. And often if you work for state government, you change governors and um, you get different directors with different ideas and different political aspirations. And that all often becomes involved in politics. So you gotta have the ability to kind of navigate that. Okay. Um, Give us one more skill. What's another skill? Um, it would help to be a people person, to be able to direct people without offending people and um, just to be able to clearly communicate in a positive way. All right, very well said. So you said a mouth. We have to be able to connect with everybody. We have to navigate the political landscape that we're operating in. We need to have the ability to connect with people. And that's a powerful, powerful thing. And, and communicate up east and west and, and, and uh, to the people all around us. So what I've come to call 360 degree communication. So I absolutely appreciate everybody sharing. Here's a question for you, homework assignment. Why don't you ask in your travels, uh, Question number one, ask people to reply to that, what they've learned from the pandemic. And I think you'll find, ask your, we're doing a thing called uh, post-pandemic tune-up, getting leaders to get together and go through a one-day exercise where they realign where they're at right now compared to where they would hope to be and the lessons learned from COVID, but maybe also some bad habits that came out of COVID. So how do we build on that? And I would encourage all of you to think these th those particular issues through. So I'm gonna grab the screen again, if I may, and we'll come back and uh, continue. So my definition of leadership is someone who uses their influence to make good things happen and deliver desired results with and through people at the right time and in the right way. So there's a whole lot going on in there, but it's about influence. And if you find a great HR leader, she or he typically has built a level of influence the people around them. And the question is, where does that come from? We'll talk about that in just a second, but we have to do things with and through people at the right time, and especially in HR, and in the right way, especially HR. So uh, my most recent book, The Successful Career Survival Guard, a sample size of 10,000 people, we had 12 career imperatives. Here's the number one career imperative. For each of us to move our careers forward, we have to create a performance track record of delivering desired results. We are, we are the people responsible for the HR function or a really important function in your organization, we've got to deliver desired outcomes. So here's an observation. Why do senior HR leaders get fired? I believe there's a lot to be learned from this discussion about HR leadership terminations, which has really caused me to think through several very important issues. 
it can be linked or can be likened to taking your car in for a serious diagnostic tune-up. Now, I bring it up in this context. We had 211 senior HR leaders go through these focus groups as part of an executive development program experience that they had, and there was a whole lot of learning. But before we go there, one last thing. The definition or origin of the word fired. So if this article is about why senior HR leaders get fired, we already talked about leadership, but what about the word fired? All right, so literally it means to discharge a gun. So that use of the term has, was, began to become applied to discharging people, pushing people out of the organization. So that's the literal meaning of the word. The legend in 1910, uh, National Cash Register founder, John Patterson is credited with using the word in dismissing many people. So he, if you didn't please him, you were gone. And so he used the term firing people. And so in the vernacular of the 21st century, 20th and 21st century, he is credited with kind of being the architect of that. Now, this is interesting. The historical usage, when people lived in communal settings in antiquity and failed to contribute to the group's survival by providing food or shelter or fire or cutting wood or water, their dwellings were frequently burnt down to force them to leave the group. They were in effect fired. So I thought that you might find that to be somewhat interesting uh, at some level. So here's the question. So what did we learn about why senior HR leaders are fired? What are the lessons learned, if you would? So termination factor number one. And if it's okay, um, I will come up with a, uh, Bernadette, if I PDF file uh, these slides and zip them to you, could you make sure that everybody who's in on this gathering gets a copy of these slides? Absolutely. Thank you so much, because you won't have time to take notes, but my goal is to get you to think. So termination factor number one, when, when senior HR leaders don't fully understand and keep current with the realities of their organization's business models, you've got big time trouble, meaning they're out of step because they are quote unquote HR people and rather than being business people. So in terms of branding, I think being a business person is really important. So as a senior HR leader, do you fully understand your organization's current business model, financials, markets, customers, and delivery system? Because if we don't, we're at a competitive disadvantage in speaking to the people in our enterprise. Number two, are you keenly aware of the current business challenges you are facing? And I would dare say most of you absolutely are because of the COVID experience and how it impacts and it has a powerful effect in how it delivers value to its owners and, and customers, if you would. So we've got to figure out not just the HR value proposition, but we have to make sure that the organization's value proposition is front and center. So this isn't coming to news as anybody, but this was the single most important factor identified. Termination factor number two, failing to create and implement a meaningful HR strategy and value proposition. So in many cases, senior HR people were let go because people would say, well, what's the strategy? What's the functional strategy to deliver the HR function forward in our organization? And what's the value proposition look like? So as a senior HR leader, are you growing and delivering capabilities for business performance? Whatever that might look like. Maybe it's staffing, maybe it's succession planning, maybe it's a performance management system, but are we doing things that are strategically positioned to link up with the organization's uh, current state of affairs and where they're going in the future? Number two, are you advancing the design and development of best practices and aligning your HR strategy to support your organization's business strategy? So question, if, you've got, if your organization has a business strategy today, are you thinking about coupling up best practices in the HR discipline to support and best support those initiatives. And then finally, is your value proposition known and understood by all stakeholders? And can you share that value proposition without feeling maybe somewhat reluctant to spit it out or maybe somewhat uh, like uh, this is just what we happen to be doing, uh, maybe some, some level of uncertainty about it. We've got to have everybody on your HR team wired into the proposition, then that has to be spread throughout the organization. So termination factor number three, failing to establish and move the right performance needles. So we clarified the specific metrics that are important. As a senior HR leader, 
Have you developed effective performance indicators and metrics that support your organization's business strategy? Again, that are known and understood by all. Do you have that scorecard? And is that scorecard part of how you operate and how you measure performance on an ongoing basis? Do you measure KPIs and report on an ongoing basis so that you always know where you stand? Are you situationally aware at this moment in time about the performance of your HR team against the KPIs that have been established? And then finally, are you proactively monitoring micro and macro trends that directly influence key business outcomes? Are you taking a little bit of time on a regular basis to think about what is coming down the road so that you're in a better position to lead your organization through the reaction and realignment process? Okay, I'll take a deep breath right there. Termination factor number four. And this is an interesting one because the first four, actually five, were very similar in terms of response rate. These were significant agreement about HR leaders, ego problems, and low emotional intelligence surfaced in there if you can't get along with people. And the comment that was made by Wanda, you got to get along with people. Wanda, great point. As a senior HR leader, are you known for demonstrating balance and impartial counsel by forging and nurturing effective and productive working relationships with all stakeholders while keeping your ego in check? Footnote, an out of control ego is the dire and absolute arch enemy of excellence. Egos can destroy, and especially in the HR function, careers pretty darn quickly if we're not careful. Uh, secondly, are you willing to take a 360 degree assessment to receive diverse feedback from and other points of view and areas of personal strengths and weaknesses? Who's coaching you? Translation, do you have somebody there who's telling you, encouraging you, lifting you up, being a role model and accountability partner to help give you feedback so that you can improve your performance on a regular and ongoing basis? All right, so now, Number five, so let's say you do have a strategic HR strategy that's in place, but it can happen very un suddenly that we find ourselves somehow disconnected to the tactics. So we have a saying at the University of Toledo where we teach a lot of HR uh, in our program that it, our goal is to make every HR, every leader in the organization an HR leader so that she or he can coach, clarify expectations. They, they comply with the law. They understand effective interviewing. They know about onboarding. We want every person in the organization to know the tactics, that they're in a better position to help support that strategy. Well, as an HR leader, do you work hard to create linkages between your HR strategy and the tactical and practical HR practices that you are implementing in your organization? This is where you can have the biggest impact on an organization's performance when great HR practices become part of your operating environment and culture. The second question is how do you measure the effectiveness of this strategic uh, tactical linkage, if you would? So you have mechanisms in place to, so we're not staring into this void, but rather there's great connectivity between strategy and tactics. Now, Number six, termination factor number six, an inability to actually lead and influence other people. As a senior leader, are you demonstrating your leadership effectiveness by setting clear direction, motivating your workforce, and positively influencing the people in your in circle of influence that are depending on you for their success? We've got to have that ability. And by the way, this is fundamentals. This is leadership 101 that surfaces in these discussions. And then next up, are you engaging and empowering your people to create a culture of high performance? So if you have three or four or five or maybe 10 or a bigger company, a staff of HR professionals, and you're their leader, are you the captain of your ship, as Gail said, to make sure that everybody's empowered to do their job so that ship can move forward? So we're, we're going to do a breakout, but for the sake of time, I'm just going to stop the screen share and ask a couple of you. Here's the, here's the question. Let me lean in. Is there anything here that you didn't already know? I would dare say probably not, maybe a little bit, but could I ask, uh, Eric, are you there? 
Are you still driving? Did we miss Eric? All right. Uh, could I ask Randall, could you, by the way, I love that haircut. You're looking good. Here's a question. Could you just comment on those first six points? Did anything jump out at you? I think a lot of it resonated and just like you said, these are things that I think everyone already knows, but I think people become lazy and they don't want to implement it because uh, two things as a leader, I mean, you have to have some type of understanding of the people who, who you're managing and know that you can't manage everyone the same way. You also have to have compassion because if you don't have that, you're not going to be able to relate with the regular ins and outs of life that the people who you are managing are dealing with. So very well said. And so you, know, you have to hit on a lot of great, great points. Well, I think the, the, your point too is we have to be compassionate for the people around us. We have to be able to relate to them and we have to be able to be empathetic with them. And that goes back to emotional intelligence, if you would. All right. So there's six things to think about. Remember, everybody's getting a copy of the PowerPoint slides. So let me pull the screen back and we'll look at a couple more things to kind of wrap up. There's 12 things. So look at termination factor number seven, lack of alignment with senior leadership team. So in theory, the eight top HR person in your organization should be part of the C-suite senior leadership team. And if they're not, we have to ask the ask the question, why not? Well, as a senior HR leader, do you work hard to stay aligned with your senior level peers across the organization? Do you connect with them regularly? Do you seek out how you can best serve them? And are you in, a, are you in constant communication with these key decision makers? Have you set up a network and a vehicle, a platform, if you would, or a channel to communicate with people so that you can share what's going on with them from an HR perspective and that they're in a position to communicate with you what's happening in the realities of the, of the workplace. And finally, do you engage in critical dialogue and are you able to courageously advocate a contrarian position with your CEO and your stakeholders when, when you need to? So if an organization is doing something and it's not making sense, are we in a position where we can step up and represent the facts about the situation from an HR perspective? And have we earned the trust of the people around us to be able to do so? Termination factor number eight, an inability to deal with a significant HR problem or crisis in a timely fashion. And we heard many testimonies to the fact that this person's organization or my organization had a real problem and I could not muster the troops. I couldn't rally people to fix it in a timely fashion. And this cost that person, or in this case, me, my job. Lesson learned, if there's a real problem, we have to be able to react quickly to it. And I think the pandemic has taught all of us that really important lesson. As a senior HR leader, do you work hard at being proactive to prevent or rapidly fix HR problems in your organization when they pop up on the screen? If some problem is lingering out there and it's an HR related thing and it's percolating and it's festering and we're not all over it, know that our credibility is being damaged and we might be prematurely putting ourselves in the, the uh, express lane checkout, if you would. Secondly, when HR crises do arise, do you put on your creativity hat and think of unique solutions and act in a quick and effective fashion to implement your solution? I would say this, that most of us have been through this in the last year and, 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 our, and our talents in these areas have increased significantly. Termination factor number nine, a question of, of HR and leader ethics. So in some cases, people got caught in ethical wrongdoing, and that was mentioned front and center in the, these discussions. So as a senior HR leader, do you demonstrate effective and ethical leadership in all your organizational dealings, even if it's something that will be a personal disadvantage to you, which will tie into our later point in the, in the, in the political arena? Uh, secondly, are you viewed as an envoy and a defender of your organization's code of conduct and ethical culture? So it's our responsibility to set that really, truly high standard. And I believe that it's really a very incumbent thing to build your trustworthiness with your peers when you do that very thing. Number 10, 
being stuck in old school HR. And we heard many interesting and, and uh, in some cases, humorous stories about organizations that were just stuck uh, in, in the year 1990, year 2000, if you would. So as a senior HR leader, do you work hard to keep abreast of HR best practices and technological changes that might provide you and your organization with some level of competitive advantage? And so I'll share this question with you right now. What are you doing to create competitive advantage with people in your organization? Those best practices can help you get there. But if we are stuck uh, in, in with an old system that we is the status quo, the name of the game, we probably aren't helping our organization or our careers in that regard. Now, termination factor number 11. When there's a sudden loss of confidence from the CEO or there's a new boss in place, we can quickly find ourselves getting a vote of no confidence. So as a senior leader, are you doing everything in your power to deliver high performance to your organization and increase your boss's confidence in you? Are you known as a go-to person, as a person who delivers desired results? Question, what's the number one factor for career success and survival? Answer, deliver desired results. When we deliver desired results, and that means, by the way, don't we all have to stay closely aligned with the expectations of our bosses to make sure that we can properly allocate our time resource, our personnel resources, so that we can get the things done that need to be done, and in Gail's words, to keep the ship moving in the direction to that, that, that port that we're sailing to. Finally, are you able to build trust with your CEO and, cre and credibility among fellow senior leaders or board members? So are you a person that has such a good reputation for getting things done that you're in a really good position to influence the people above you and next to you in addition to the people that report to you? Now, finally, number 12, engaging in troublesome political or, pol uh, excuse me, organizational politics and gamesmanship. So as a senior leader, do you stay focused on doing the right things to deliver desired results and avoid unhealthy political activity and gamesmanship? Are you willing to use your political capital when it's required to do the right thing? Sometimes organizations are moving in a direction that might not there be, be in their best interest. And we built up the capital that we can use to help the organization do the right things. And then finally, as a, as a leader, do you have a reputation for being trustworthy and straightforward. Or I've heard uh, people in our focus groups talk about he, this guy, political animal, and it cost him his job because he played politics around everything. So that political thing is not an unusual thing. It's part of organizational life. But are we using our political capital, if you would, to make a difference to help improve the organization versus some political agenda that might serve us? Uh, as a standalone. So I want you to think about this as we wrap up. Look what Socrates said. It's awesome. He said, the ongoing challenges of life mandates applying all our wisdom to our daily situations, lest we fall prey to our own folly. So if you think about what Socrates is saying here, the word folly is foolishness. So if we don't do the things that we know are true, we can fall prey to our own foolishness. And that's pretty powerful statement. And by the way, that's what they think Socrates looked like uh, carved out of marble. But I think we're probably better off to, to be able to remember what John Wayne said. He said, life is tough, but it's tougher if you're stupid. Now, I don't say that to offend anybody. Ignorance means I don't know what to do. Stupid means I know what to do, but for whatever reason, I don't act on it. I don't make a difference in the people around me, even though I know I should. I know I lose my temper. I know I shouldn't, but I, I continue to do that. I know I don't think as strategically as I should. I know I should do it, but I just, I just, I, I'm not there. So at the end of the day, that's what makes life difficult. So what we want to think about as we wrap up the conversation today is, what is it going to take for you to become more wise? And a wise person is a person who knows what to do in a given situation, and she or he does it. So, I want to ask uh, if you think about these quick things along the way as we wrap up. Um, I think number one, take a look in the mirror. I know I spend a lot of time looking in the mirror to reflect on what I'm doing right and what might need some work. 
So I would encourage you to have a personal planning retreat with yourself to be able to get that done. Secondly, conduct a serious HR SWOT analysis on your organization and on your leadership to figure out what your strengths are, where those weaknesses lie, where are the opportunities to get better at your game? And finally, what threats are there to keeping you from moving forward? And I would say the biggest threat for most of us these days is just the time pressure that we're experiencing in so many ways. Bernadette made a really good point about there's only so many hours in a day, and I would absolutely agree with you. So we have to learn how to invest our time more wisely. Number three, identify those gaps and take specific steps to close them quickly. And that simply means, let's say your performance management system is broken. Your onboarding program is highly ineffective. And those are difference making practices for your organization. Figure out a way to build a team around them and get ownership around the issue and help that team make that, make, provide that solution and make that change more quickly. And we've all learned a lot about that during COVID. Number four, get everybody that reports to you in your organization on the same page with regards to expectations for not only what to do, but also the practices you're going to implement to make the place world class. And then finally, lead like your career depends on it. We make the biggest difference when we invest in the people around us because your career success and survival does depend on your willingness and your ability to get stuff done with and through people. So there's some questions that you're gonna see. Uh, and I think this is part of a personal retreat that you might consider having. But I think this, these are questions for all of us on any given day. Hey, you're good at what you do. You wouldn't be where you're at if you're not. So what do you need to keep doing? Number two, all right, what, what's missing here from those 12 things and all the questions asked that you maybe need to start doing to take your game up a couple notches. And then finally, what are you doing that's no longer value added for your organization that's getting in the way of excellence, that's getting in the way of you being the best version of yourself? And I think sitting down maybe in the next couple of days while some of the stuff is fresh in your mind and working these three questions collectively can be a really good way of getting your arms around these issues, if you would. So in the words of Thoreau, this time, like all time, is a great time if we know but what to do with it. And I think that there's the big lesson for all of us. And I put this picture in here of this child uh, going down the slide. I know uh, my, my kids, I had to talk them onto the roller coasters and talk them onto the slides. This person obviously isn't like excited about making this trip, if you would, until they got into it. But there's an adult making the ride with this young lady, I'm assuming a dad, who's making the ride with you to help you overcome the things that might challenge you, who's riding the slide with you to help you be the best version of yourself. So I'll stop right there and say thanks for being a great group and for taking action. And I always withhold that last hit of the hit of the uh, machine because I, I want to make sure that it, it's worthy. But a plus for being here today, A plus for investing in yourselves, and an A plus in, in preparing yourself to move forward with some of these issues, if you would. So according to my clock, we have a couple minutes and Bob assured me he was protecting you. He said, Clint, I know you, hard stop at 10 o'clock. So at the end of the day, any, any questions from anybody? Anybody, come on, question from anyone. Jump right in. We got to have one question before we go. Leave some contact information. Um, I will. Okay. Yeah, absolutely. I'll make sure I'll send an email to Bernadette. Should that email come to you? That would be fine. We, is it, or put it on the last slide of your PowerPoint, possibly. Okay, no, no. I don't, I, I'm going to send you, I'll send you a copy of this article, a couple other articles that you might find to be of use and a copy of the PDF file from the PowerPoint. Okay. So you can use it as part of your retreat. So I'll get that done. But I just want to say this, everybody. I, I've been at, I'm, I'm 65. I'm going to be 66 here uh, in, next week. And I, I'm just, I'm a work in progress. So at the end of the day, I think I, God has created us so that we can learn continuously. I'm very appreciative of that. Um, I will retire from the University of Toledo on May 7th. 
after 37 years, and I'm really excited. Mm -hmm. I have some things I've got to get done. And if I don't retire, I will not have time to do them, some new opportunities and some other things. So it's been my privilege to represent the University of Toledo. This might be one of my last few uh, formal representations of the university, but it has been a blast. And I, if you need anything, you can reach out to me, even a question about anything under the sun. But if I could say this, I'll, I'll, my last comment will be this. The biggest lesson that I have learned in over the years is the power of purpose. So I think when we have purpose in our lives, it really makes things different uh, and it changes us. So I want to encourage you to think bigger. And once you really clarify what you want to do next or where you're going to take your organization, identify that purpose, then get in the habit of taking time every day to sit, to think, to optimize the use of your time, your talent, your treasure, your energy, and then perform. And so um, that, and that, that's my next book, by the way. It's the title of the book is called Stop and the Power of Purpose. So sit, think, optimize, perform. And I would just encourage you to say, you know what? I need to sit down and think. I don't need to rush anymore. So thanks for investing in yourself. Thank you for the treasure of your time and for allowing me to be a little sliver in your leadership journey, everybody. God bless you good. And God bless the L-E-H. R, or excuse me, the, the, the L-E-R-A for the great work that you do. I'm so accustomed to sticking that H in there. So thanks, everybody. I'll stick around afterwards for a couple of minutes if anybody has any questions. Hey, hey, Clint. Actually, uh, Doug Rammel, I, I uh, purposely got on today just because I wanted to thank you as a former student and a longtime uh, follower. Um, you know, I am I'm very much... I didn't have this when I was in your class. It's you know, been many, a couple of years. It's many, been a couple of years. Many, many, many moons ago. But um, and, I, and of course, I'm wearing my IU shirt today instead of my Toledo shirt. But um, you've you've influenced a lot of lives. And so part of the reason I wanted to get on today is uh, to thank you for the for the effort and the work that you've put in and the lives you've touched. Mine's been one of them. Well, thank you so very much. You know what? That is that is I use the term priceless. Uh, to be able to play a small role in the development of people is, is such a gift. I mean, such a blessing. And it's been a privilege to be able to do some of that over the course of my lifetime. So thank you, Doug. I appreciate it very, very much. And Doug can back me up. At one time, I did have hair and a dark brown mustache. Doug, when you were a student of mine, yes or no? That is that is true. It, that is true. There you, you go. Well, you've the always words... been a good looking man, but uh, used to be yeah. a hairier, hairier man. Wait, let me go get my wife. So she can repeat that. <laughs> No, <laughs> any other questions for me from anybody uh, Clint um, I just wanted to say I think one issue is you got to understand when you need to leave and you know we've all been there where maybe your ethics don't match what's going on with an organization mm -hmm. that it's really tough you know you can't necessarily measure success by being at some company for 25 years but you have to also make the tough decision to say, I don't fit here. This isn't what I believe in. And when it's time to go. Gail, that's great coaching. And you are so right. And uh, this past week, I did a, a program, an ethics program for uh, the United States Army National Guard command group. So there was about 100 uh, brigadier, two, one, three. It was it was kind of like a constellation: three star generals, two star generals, one star generals. So I felt like I was in the cosmos, and then another group of about a hundred colonels that were there, and it, it was all about ethics, about doing the right thing. And and your point is so very well made that we have to know if the situation is toxic when we need to go. But a person came up to me, actually a small cadre of people came up to me afterwards. And this is not a political statement. They said, Clint, we know you give this talk and do work with, uh, I, I think I've done training for about 8,000 senior military and intelligence community leaders uh, in the last eight years. It's been amazing to me that they, they came up in mass, a group and said, you know, Clint, you really need to do this with our government officials, with, with the Congress and, and the House and the Senate, because we have this very high standard. Again, I'm not trying to make a political statement or besmirch it, besmirch people, but we know that power does have a corrupting effect on people. So we really have to be careful. And I and your 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 point is very well made, Gail. That and the ship captain, I, I salute you. Thank you. Any other Chris, you had your hand up. Mr. Chris just, Anderson. Just the first one is a comment of structurally, you've pretty much nailed it and it's appropriately overwhelming. 
That's the first thought I have. The, the second one, Clint, is a question. I'm, it was the one about connecting with the CEO. And I was just curious in that conversation, any anecdotes about people that were particularly effective in aligning with their CEO? Were there any anecdotes? To me, that's so fundamental, but it's easy to say, difficult to accomplish. That's a great point. And I think interestingly, in some cases you have, there are still a number of organizations that look at, at uh, HR as a cost rather than as a vehicle for creating competitive advantage. So if your organization, if, if a person is, has a reputation for creating competitive advantage, the conversations with the CEO are rather natural. And I think um, that if, but if an organization doesn't take, it's from, it comes from the top down, if the CEO doesn't take uh, HR seriously, that conversation becomes much more cumbersome, uncomfortable, and um, maybe perfunctory rather than it being a difference maker. So why don't you give me a call and we can, we can continue that discussion. But I would just say this, people have across the board said, if you're an HR leader, you're the top person in your organization and you're not connected to your CEO or division president, uh, and, and, and you're, you're, not, you're not their right-hand person, then you're not, you're not doing what you need to be doing. And that's a really important and poignant point. I will reach out. It's been a while. Thanks, my friend. Anybody else? Well, my wife, Cindy, and I spend a lot of time in the country of Haiti. At least we did prior to the pandemic. And so the Haitians have a great saying, and it's, way content, way ou. And it means it's my privilege to be with you. So I'll just say, I'll end by saying, way content, way ou. Clint, thank you so much for joining us this morning. That was a fantastic presentation. Um, thank you, Emily. Bob asked us to remind everyone that the recording and the PowerPoint and the articles that Clint sends us will be sent out to you and available on the Detroit Lira webpage. Of course, we want to invite you to the upcoming meetings, May 13th, the topics curiosity, conflict, and communication. It'll be again from 9 to 10 a.m. Eastern time. And then on June 10th, we have revisiting social media responses during the pandemic and political divide, again from 9 to 10. So we hope to see all of you there. So thank you so much for coming and we'll see you next month. Thank you, Emily. Hey, Bernadette, are you at your computer right now? Would you hit me? I am. Will you hit me with an email and then I'll just attach the materials in the next 10 minutes so you can ship them out to everybody, okay? I sure will. Do I have your email? Um, Clinton.longnecker at utoledo.edu. I know I spit that out. So Clinton.longnecker at utoledo.edu. Dot edu. And, I, and as an emeritus professor, I'll keep that, which is really a very nice uh, you know, gift the university gives when people are, are leaving, that you get to hang on to your email address. Doug, remember that. You reach out, young man. Take care, everybody. And thanks again for your time. The treasure, the treasure of your time. Bye. I just hit thanks, send Clint. just to make sure that it comes through to you.